Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for the kind introduction and for making it possible for this gathering to be here this morning and to discuss very important issues for the uh, healthcare provision and service in Sri Lanka. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that we are really uh, honoured and privileged to be able to work with uh, the Sri Lanka Ministry of Health, uh, also uh, the WHO and the uh, University of York, uh, as well as the other uh, organizers and co-sponsors of today's event. Um, let me begin by uh, just uh, giving a very brief introduction of uh, some relevant work that is being done back in Singapore at the university, at the Nanyang Technological University, where we, uh, where we work. And uh, since last year, we have formed a particular uh, research group, which we uh, refer to as the Medical Humanities Research Cluster, which is actually uh, a group of faculty members from across the university working on uh, health and medical related issues um, and I would just briefly mention a few areas here. We have historians in the group and uh, literary scholars, also uh, linguists and um, anthropologists and philosophers and so on, all working on different projects, some in uh, collaboration with each other and uh, the research that we're going to uh, introduce to you today uh, is part of the work of this group. Uh, we are also very uh, happy to be working with uh, Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya uh, and his team at the Univ University of York. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya is actually also now visitor, uh, sorry, visiting professor coming to York uh, every year to give some lectures and uh, seminars. Uh, in fact, NTU uh, is uh, not a new person in this uh, particular relationship between Singapore and uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, one of our professors, Mei Lun, has already been working quite closely with uh, some of the uh, academics and also uh, healthcare officials and uh, practitioners in Sri Lanka through a number of projects, such as the one that she is currently uh, carrying out on uh, the behavior and attitudes uh, towards civic engagement in infectious disease reporting in Sri Lanka. Uh, in fact, she told me just before we came out that she'll be coming here in November to pursue this uh, project. So we are very happy to be able to add to the uh, uh, extension and deepening of this relationship so as to benefit both countries. Uh, here's just a list of some of the projects that uh, the group that I just mentioned uh, is working on. I won't have time to go into the details, but here's just a quick slide to give you a sense of the spread and uh, uh, range of uh, research that is going on in our university that is relevant to today's discussion. In fact, more relevant to our concern today are three projects with a possible fourth one that me and my colleagues uh, in uh, NTU are uh, working on. Especially the first one is the most relevant one. This is uh, the, the project that we're working with uh, clinicians and others back in uh, Singapore in the uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital and specifically the urology clinic. And uh, we, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, this particular project today, looking into the doctor-patient interaction patterns in, uh, in the urology clinic. Okay, so just a word about uh, our methodology in uh, studying communication in healthcare settings, we are looking into the details of the interaction 
and uh, not just uh, at uh, people's perception or reporting of what they do, but in what they actually do. And in order to do that, we need a methodology that would allow us to uh, make uh, insightful observations into that process. Uh, the particular methodology that we use is called conversation analysis, which is a uh, very different method from the usual one of categorized and coding uh, methodology such as uh, RIAS. Uh, so what is CA? In a nutshell, CA or conversation analysis is non-experimental and non-coding. What it is, is really a, an interdisciplinary method that incorporates both linguistic as well as psychological, cognitive, and social and social interactional uh, methods all combined together. It's a holistic approach to the study of interaction, taking into account the language that is, that is used, the cultural background that comes into the interaction, the cognitive and social interactional features that we find in the uh, data. So it's a very empirical and scientific approach to communication and interaction in a variety of settings, including healthcare. What we need to have in order to do this kind of research is actual recordings of consultations or interactions and a close microanalysis or moment by moment analysis of the actual interaction process, uh, offering insights into specific contexts, including medical contexts. So as I said, it's an empirical and uh, uncontrolled and authentic kind of uh, research methodology. So today for our purpose, we want to focus on some health literacy issues. We take that as a starting point and look into our data to see what we can find in matters of health literacy in the doctor-patient interaction that we uh, collect data from and uh, uh, perform analysis on. At this point, let me introduce uh, to you uh, my colleague, Dr. Lim Ni Eng from our university who is a partner with me on this team of uh, doctor-patient interaction project. He's gonna take us through a little bit of the data to show you what kind of things we can do and what kind of recommendations we can make. So without further ado, let me I call upon Ni Eng to carry on with the presentation. Okay, thank you, KK. So, um, yeah, the health literacy, that was also mentioned by the Director General for Health Services earlier today. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit about where is our current understanding of health literacy. It's a relatively new concept, 20 years old, but obviously has taken uh, the world by storm or the medical community by storm. It's a hotly debated idea because uh, we believe it's going to play a key role in better health communication and better health outcomes, right? However, if we look at the medical health literacy research, currently in the field, what you will find is that most of this research can be called functional literacy, meaning, you know, uh, literacy in the sense of reading, reading, writing, numeral skills uh, of perhaps medical terms. And if we believe that, okay, uh, if people know them, they should understand uh, how to get better medical uh, health care. However, for health literacy to work, it must also include literacies of procedural knowledge and judgment skills. This is our most updated understanding of what health literacy should encompass. So with the data that we have of actual consultations, what we want to do is we want to take a look at what sorts of literacy actually impact and are crucial in the doctor-patient interaction. The actual seven minutes that the patient spends, or nine minutes that the patient spends inside the clinic talking to the doctor. So uh, I apologize for not having enough transcripts. So you, you would have to share if you have one of these. So what you have in your hands uh, are the actual transcripts of what is being said 
in the clinic in an actual consultation. Uh, it's, it's fairly long, so I will not go through all of them, but I will pick out certain bits of it that we feel are quite uh, revealing and important in addressing this issue. So, uh, our data, okay, first a bit about our data, is from 150 sessions of uh, first visit consultations in urology. Out of the 150 sessions, uh, it, it, some of it is English, some of it is Mandarin or dialects. The trajectory of the consultations in this specialist urology clinic basically goes like this. You have, it looks a bit like primary care. So, you know, you elicit the concern, there's a history taking by the physician, there's a bit of physical examination where the doctor checks your prostate, and then they'll go for a diagnostic recommendation after they check the prostate, and then they close the consultation. Uh, so what we'll be looking at uh, is, we want to be specific, specific medical context. We'll be looking at this diagnostic recommendation stage that the doctors does after the physical examination in the clinic. And what we'll be looking at as well is for the symptom of hematuria. So the, we have selected clips in which the patients are coming into a clinic specifically for this problem, blood in the urine, and what the doctor does. Okay? So uh, if we can, let me just change this. If you have the transcripts, I, what I would like to do is uh, I would like to play and maybe you can follow a bit the first one, which starts perhaps at uh, line 62. So what we do is that, uh, what we need to do is that we need to recommend a few things. Okay, mm -hmm. One is actually a uh, special x-ray to make sure that there's no stones or any tumors inside the kidney. And mm -hmm. we need to recommend a scope for you. A scope? Yeah, a scope basically is to look inside the bladder to, take, uh, to see whether... Okay. Okay. So if we can, if we, what we can see, you know, following the transcript, what the doctor does when he starts to recommend the scope, he, he says, I could recommend a few things, which could be heard as the patient as framing the diagnostic test as being preferred, but maybe unnecessary. Okay. Uh, in actual fact, the use, the doctor's use of need to later on reviews his medical opinion that in fact doing the scope, meaning you have to put a camera in to look at the bladder is actually imperative for this patient. Okay, and the patient begins to inquire a pushback on this recommendation as it comes. I would like to take a look at, as, the, as the talk goes further on, starting at line uh, 110. You can take a look at line 110. I'll play line 110. Besides that, we do a scan, alright, this is a special x-ray to see, to take a look to see any other stones or anything inside the kidney stuff. So scan, what does it do? Uh, it's x-ray, special x-ray, to look inside the kidney to see anything that the flow of the, the, the contrast down, mm -hmm. and then also the, the, the special dye that comes down, and also see any stones that you can see. Mm -hmm. So scan, uh, the x-ray of the... Mm -hmm. So we need to arrange everything for you. We talk about, about the whole total process, about four to six weeks in total. We do the, today we do a urine test, we show no infection. Uh, we arrange an x-ray and we will help you do the scope. But the scope, no, right? Can I judge? Okay, uh, so ultimately... Okay, <laughs> the, 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 the computer screen is not, not working for me. But what I want to say, if you have the transcript, uh, you would see that at line 110, what the patient says is besides that. Now, the patient's formulation of besides that can be taken either to mean what other tests do I have to do? That's one understanding of that. Or it could mean what other tests can I choose from? So there's another, there's a, a very, it's another kind of understanding. And as the doctor progresses and explains this down, you would see when the doctor at line 134 says, we'll arrange the x-ray and we'll help you do the scope. Uh, notifying that more than one test has to be done for that kind of symptom, what the patient does is she shakes her head and say, pardon, scope, no, right? So she responds in a way that tells you that she's rejecting this understanding that you need to do more than one test. In her mind, she thinks that she can choose from different tests, right? So um, I, I want to, maybe because the, the video is not working too well for me. I'll go down, uh, I'll will, I will, I will go to a transcript instead. This is what I was talking about. 
I will not play the video because I think it's, uh, it's going to, it's, it's, it's cramming up the PowerPoint. But I would like to uh, bring you now a little, a, little, a little bit later on in line 179, and you can look at the screen if you don't have the transcript. Uh, at line 179, what the, what the patient says is uh, she, she reconfirms the need to do multiple tests. She says, so you would have to do the scope. And the doctor says, we recommend the, uh, a scope as part of, uh, if, and the patient says, if you do the scope, then do you need to do the scan and the x-ray? So she's still, she's still in this mind that these tests that the doctors are actually prescribing is like multiple choices, three choose one or four choose one, okay? And uh, the doctor explains that this different test looks at different things, meaning you have to do all of them, and yet the patient is still of the belief that a singular test is sufficient to do the job. Okay. At line 248, the patient starts to uh, say, uh, after, so today you will take the urine test, the, 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 pa the patient asks, uh, and the doctor says yes, and the patient says, if the whole thing is fine, okay, inquiring the what if questions, if the urine test is okay. Then the doctor says, if there's nothing wrong, I won't call you. The doctor formulation of what, if there's nothing wrong, I won't call you pertains specifically to the test of bacterial growth in the urine, but the patient may understand otherwise. And the doctor later continues with the expression, we will leave it if there's nothing abnormal pertaining only to the urine, urine test, and the, and, the, uh, and the patient nods the head, and later on you can see what happens. So nothing is wrong, this is what. So at this point in time, what the patient is doing, he, she's signing the consent form for the scope. Remember the scope? There is the camera that she, you, know, you have to put in through your genitals to look into your bladder. She's signing this thing and say, it, so if nothing is wrong, this is what? And she flips that paper, the consent form, holds up the scope consent form and questions the necessity of further tests in the event of a no problem result from earlier tests. So she feels that you know, if, if, if my urine test is fine, why am I going for the scope? Okay. However, the doctor misses this gesture because he's busy looking at his computer doing this electronic medical recording and did not get the question. Uh, the patient repeats the what if question in the event of a no problem of the urine test. And the doctor continues to say, that's fine then, that's fine. Okay, the, he, he, the doctor is continuing to understand the patient question as only about the urine test and not about the whole procedure of diagnostic as a whole. So what this leads to at the end is at the close of the consultation, the, the patient reveals the understanding that further tests will be forfeited if the urine test is okay. And that happens at line 370 later down. So if nothing is wrong with me today, everything will be forfeited. And, he wave, and she waves the consent form. She still thinks that, okay, I'll take the urine test and if that one comes up negative, I don't have to do the scope. And the doctor would have to you know, explain it all. And so it took a, it took a very long time for the patient to understand what's going on and all this relationship of the test. So, what, I would like to do some quick takeaways from the example, okay? What were the procedural knowledge or judgment skills, types of health literacy that was lacking in this consultation? One thing that you can see is patient, the patient did not initially see the multiplicity of tests as a package, but instead views them as various types of a single test. That's what they think. Okay, therefore allowing her to shop, like shopping for a test that she likes. Later on, when she understands that it's actually multiple tests, the patient then formulates their, them as a multi-stage process where passing the first test, then that means she doesn't need to do the next one. Okay, so patients do not have the concept of differential diagnosis. And if you're a clinician, I know you, you would know what this means, that you need multiple tests to eliminate various causes. But patients don't have that. And so, uh, do not un they do not understand the relationship between different diagnostic tests to reach an accurate diagnosis, okay? Now, I would like to play this one, uh, but, you know, because of the video. This one is a contrastive example in which the, but I'll just go out towards the, the, the transcript. This one is an example in which the doctor actually details the relationship between the symptom 
and the possible diagnosis before the recommendation of the test. So he would say things like, there are lots of reasons why your urine has blood, okay? Uh, that's why the A&E gives you antibiotics. Uh, other things that can cause this would be like stones or poss possibly tumour. And so the patient starts to understand that this is just a symptom and I need to you know, eliminate these possible things to get at what's causing problems, okay? And so when the doctor gets to the recommendation part, the patient appreciates it. He says things like, yeah, that's more thorough. Because now he understands what, what the doctor is actually doing. So what we see in examining the consultation in the uh, urology department is that you have this trajectory, a very standard trajectory of doing things, or uh, specifically for, for, for a symptom like hematuria. But what is actually missing is this part. Because if you have this part, then you're actually providing a key health literacy to prevent resistance to what it could be a very critical diagnostic test, such as the scope that you want to use to prevent tumour or to look at tumour. Right? So I'll, I'll leave uh, some of the conclusions to uh, KK. Yeah, so I hope uh, we've uh, been able to give you a taste of the kind of data that we're dealing with and what we can do with that data. It seems from just, you know, those few examples that we've seen that, you know, with this kind of in-depth analysis of actual consultations and the interaction and the, dy the, 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 the dynamics of the interaction between doctors and patients, we can actually say quite a... Uh, a few things about uh, how the interaction has been successful or could be made uh, more successful, more effective. Uh, so patients' real understanding of the consultation, that is one of the main questions that we ask of the data. And also on the part of the doctor, how they can structure their talk, how can th they can design their talk, what words to use, what... Uh, things to say at particular moments in the interaction and what pitfalls to avoid. These are very important points that doctors can also learn from such data. So with this kind of uh, study, we hope to uh, provide uh, some insights and recommendations for our practitioners in the healthcare system, also for patients to better understand what the doctors are trying to convey to them. And of course, at the end of the day, health literacy is about making the best decisions. And in, in, in uh, situations of doctor-patient interaction, these decisions must be reached in collaboration with the doctor. And that is why health literacy can be uh, approached not only from the point of view of uh, the words and the concepts and functional literacy, but also from the point of view of uh, procedural knowledge of interaction and of doctor-patient communication. Thank you very much. <clears throat>